Hi. Hi. Lita. Hello, Sukin Lita. How are you? I am very well. So happy to see you. Okay, so where are you right now? I see there's a loft above there. You've got lots of flowers on your head. What's happening? Where are you? I am in my art slash music studio, but we're in the art area. And the loft is uh, the, it's basically like a, a reading nook. I have like a library up there and like a bunch of pillows so my kids can like watch their games, their videos and stuff while I work down here. Is your baby in the loft? Not right now because it would be very dangerous, but um, <laughs> she really enjoys to be up there with her brother and they eat popcorn there while I'm here doing my thing. Now you have a special contraption on you. Off camera, you have this special light unit. Yeah. That is, uh, can you describe what that is for? What, what the heck is that? So basically when Ms. Rona decided to not only show up, but stay and like overstay her invitation, um, all of this asks for live shows, you know, live shows and streaming and da -da 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 -da. so you know me I, I like to be extra with it i like to everything has to be beautiful everything all the time has to be beautiful and and i try to make things really pro as much as i can so this is a a light that you can control and you know has knobs and things so you can light yourself up so it things look a little bit sharper um and that's what i'm doing because you know what i mean you got a bit of showbiz up top here. Exactly. You've got, you've got your good light for all of the virtual casts and, exactly. and performances. Was that yeah. expensive or is it pretty, pretty? No, pretty pretty accessible. I mean, I went to the place, uh, the video, whatever, and I was like, I am a painter. And I am usually in front of the camera because obviously <laughs> I'm a do that. <laughs> but if I were to get you know, like a little setup for like a little, like a YouTube tutorial, you know, where I'm teaching people how to do makeup really poorly. What would you recommend? And then he got this like $400 and I'm like, <laughs> no, you didn't understand. I am a painter. I am poor. Okay. I need the cheapest one that you have. And he's like, okay, take this one. And that was it. Well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, reveal a little bit of my um, illusion here. Mm -hmm. So this is a bed spread that I got. Um, I got it in um, in Mexico, Mexico City. Um, and then also, so like my whole apartment is very, well, my house is very messy. So I just thought, okay, I'm going to just put this up. <laughs> what this is, this is what's behind. It's like... All this crap, all this <laughs> stuff. I put a couple of gels on the kitchen. The kitchen, exactly, you yeah. see that there? Yeah. And this is this is my this is like um this is my lighting. It's, yeah. Yeah. This is uh thirteen dollars on Spadina in Chinatown. Yep. yep. And it I gives a so. real mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. real cool situation here. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I feel like in these times, like. I want to live in the fantasy, you know, like I, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to control the narrative, if I have to be the director, the engineer, the singer, the producer, dee -dee -da -dee -da -dee -da, I still want to be in the fantasy. So if a little light with a little knob is going to help me keep in the fantasy, I welcome it. I got this one too. Fantastic. Right. And so look at the difference. This looks like makes you look a little healthier. This one shows my eye infection. Exactly. Here we go. Exactly. I've been like noticing. If I want, I can get really close and be like, flawless. Ooh, forever 21. <laughs> Turn it off. It's still going to be okay. But, you know, you know, help yourself where you can. We're sharing the tricks of the trade. Absolutely. And I am all about that. I don't like it when people are secretive and they want to hold all the knowledge and all this stuff. It's like, you know. Well, I've been noticing you're working really hard, especially online since the pandemic. You're doing 
virtual performances, uh, you name it. You're you're always up there on IG and all kinds of things. And you know, the internet is a, such an interesting space to have to embrace in this time and place where we can't meet face to face. Yeah. So I mean, um, how how, uh, how are you kind of um, what does it take for you to embrace that? What What's the mindset that enables you to go, okay, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this. How does that compare to the previous model of like going out on tour and meeting people face to face? Well, I, for one, enjoy not being in a group of a lot of people. I, for one, love, it doesn't happen too much anymore because things are winding down. But I particularly enjoy going to the no frills and people parting ways because I have arrived. Not because I have arrived, but I'm just like another person that can possibly get them sick till they're like, Ugh. <laughs> I like it. I love it. <laughs> I don't like people wearing open toes. I hate being an airplane. I hate being an airplane and the next, the person next to me wearing a tank top, flip flops and a, like a, like shorts. Uh, yeah. Why would you put your bare skin on the, that's to me the reason why Rona is still here and it's not going anywhere because of people. Do you think I want I don't want to see people's open toes in the summer? That's why I kept my socks on. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't need to see that. I don't know you like that. You know, and it's always people with the ugly feet. I'm like, no, no, no. So all I have to say. You like it. You there like no segue actually into that question. I mean, you're basically online stuff. You don't have to see people's stuff. Exactly. You so just have your own stuff. Before Rona, I was working all the time because I got three kids that I got to feed. So I don't get to just like lounge and think about the, when my next inspiration is going to come. It's like, no, the inspiration better come while I just cut paper. And then when I cut the paper, an idea hopefully comes to me, but I'm doing something, you know, like I am constantly creating, you know, like I feel like, you know, I have maybe 10 more years until, you know, people are going to start being like, oh, wow, you have wrinkles. You can't be in music. So I'm always thinking like, oh, okay, let's, let's create something legendary. And I, and I always think about a legacy. I think about a legacy for my children. I think about all of the ideas that I have inside of me. So I just shifted, you know, I shifted gears. Um, the shows are going to happen. I'm still performing. I feel like I'm working even more um, because I'm able to step back and I'm able to really compartmentalize the things that I want to do. So the projects that I'm doing, you know, I'm unveiling little by little. And I feel like because we can't really go outside, shoot stuff outside, it seems like I'm doing so much. But to me, I'm not really doing so much. I'm, I'm basically revealing stuff that I've been working, you know, since the beginning of the year, since last year and so on. You know, it sounds like that you're using the internet and online and all these experiences as another discipline, another paintbrush, another thing of your paints, another way of creativity. Mm -hmm. So that's great to hear. Um, one of the, there's a couple of focuses that the Venus Fest has, and that is the idea of how we move forward through this pandemic and share our music and how, how it is that we can continue making what we do. Um, and also another pillar that they'd like to speak about is this idea of inclusivity. Inclusivity, um, there's been a real push within the industry to be more inclusive. And um, I mean, there, it's such a tricky word because it can be a real catchphrase too. That idea of like inclusivity at its very worst could be butt covering, yeah. stereotyping, box ticking. Yeah. Um, what is inclusivity? Uh, what do you think it takes for it to be done well? Or what does it even mean to you? Or is it just like kind of like a institutional catchphrase that people are bandying around right now? I think it's all of the above. You know, I find that, you know, a festival like Venus Fest, where their mantra or their artist statement is to only book female or female identifying folk. That's it. Like, that's your inclusivity. Like, you don't really need to push anything forward because this is what you're about. So, but it's always, it's always groups and it's always the people that are already doing what they're supposed to be doing that always have to push these labels out, I find. 
you know, because when you see, you know, the giant, big, huge festivals, like they're not talking about inclusivity. They're not talking about any, any of that, you know, because it's capitalism, you know, and they are just there so that, you know, people come and buy their tickets and that's it in three days, it's done. You know, the trash is left on the grounds. See you next year, you know. Um, but it definitely is tricky. And for someone who, you know, I, I make music about certain things that are deemed political. Um, even if I sing about flowers, it is political because it comes out of my, my body, you know. So. Um, Has there been any time where the strive to for inclusivity has um, failed you? I mean, it never, it doesn't fail me. I feel like it embarrasses other people. Like I'm never, I feel embarrassed for other people. And I see other people failing because of just trying too hard. Like I feel like when you are inclusive, when you are fair, when you have a curatorial practice um, that is impeccable, you know, you're going to be choosing work that is good, you know, and you're going to recognize in your in your practice that excellence comes in many shapes, many forms, many bodies, many colors, many credos, whatever, 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 you know. So because there's also something about having to be like the one black drop or the brown drop or like the the, yeah, the, the, the ethnic, the ethnic right. little spice in you know in the oatmeal or whatever like you know it's just like oh i guess today i'm cinnamon you know it's like okay, are you dharma like, masala right. are you dharma masala okay thank you you know like that's i'm just kind of like i mean that's embarrassing you know like that doesn't really i'll be the soy sauce exactly you be the soy sauce i'll be i don't know what i'll be you know <laughs> like it's like the, 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 I don't, you know, it's like, that's the, 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 that's the thing. It's like that. I'm like, you know, it's 2020. We're still dying. People are still hungry. People are being evicted. The last thing that I need is for someone to like push their versatility and their diversity agenda, like on my face. Like if you're booking me, I assume that you are what you're supposed to do that's it but if i look at the bill and you know i'm like the weirdo in between all the plat wearing rock and roll dudes then we have a problem you know so mm. and then even then i'm just kind of like well i guess just charge them more i don't care i'm over this you know what <laughs> I, I really appreciate um that you always speak your mind or you you often speak your mind mm. and sometimes you've been bitten back online, but you continue to speak your mind. Um, recently, you spoke out about your experiences, including sexual abuse with Ian Campo, formerly of a tribe called Red. Um, oftentimes, there's been a shroud of silence within the indigenous community to speak out against perpetrators for fear of furthering yeah. you know, racism and, and shame and blame sustained by colonization. And yet, you spoke out about this. And you were one of a few women to do so. Mm -hmm. um, why was it important um, for you to to speak up, and how difficult was that? Well, number one, I, I feel like I was waiting to write that for last the last three years, but I wasn't. I didn't feel. I didn't feel like my son was old enough for me to um, put that out there. Um, to have a conversation with him. So that's very important to me. Like, first and foremost, my family. Secondly, there was, um, you know, an ongoing legal battle issues, like like some legalities that didn't pertain me that, you know, I didn't want to take away from and I didn't want to divert attention from that. And by that, I mean, I didn't want Ian to use me as a distraction, as an excuse to not finalize, you know, the job and the work relationship with the band, which are my friends. Um, and lastly, you know, thinking about his children, thinking about his family, you know, which is not my, my problem and it wasn't my role, but, you know, he has so many issues, you know, that it's not my place to talk to talk about in this context but you know even though 
you know, I said what I said and I stand by everything that I stand for. I'm still a mother. So I look at his wife and his children. And that was for me very important to make sure that they were going to be taken care of, you know. So that's why I didn't do it before. But I and I did it that that time because of his apology. I, I felt like his apology, which to me wasn't sincere. I feel like it was like taken from different bits of different other apologies out there. Um, and that same day I realized that he had blocked me. So for me, it was an invitation. So you could say that I did it out of spite, but it wasn't out of spite. For me, it was an invitation to, to put my story forward, you know, because he's not naming any names. He's just basically putting all the women in one group. Like everyone had the same experience, but it's many experiences. And when he left the band, you know, many women came to me and asked me to not say their name. The same with Bear, the same with Tim, the same with Guillaume. Like they were like, this is what happened to me. I'm very glad he's out, but I don't want people knowing because, you know, indigenous people are already so uber traumatized. They don't need yet another pointing fingers. Of course, you know, we can't trust this Indians, you know, and all that stuff. So I'm like, okay. But it was the right time, you know. It was the right time to do it. It, yeah. it all comes down to I was, you know, my language is better. My writing is better. Like, I was able to understand many things that I didn't understand before. And um, sometimes we write from emotion and we make a lot of mistakes. And once it's online, it's there forever. So it was my time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, uh people uh, uh, talk about a sort of toxic bystander phenomenon that can happen when you turn a blind eye and not have these difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Why is it time to like not avoid them, but to actually try to communicate about some of these conflicts within communities? I think that every person has to bring forth their narrative, their story, their whatever they want to share when they're ready. First and foremost, I also, you know, when I put my stuff out, there was a handful of people that basically blamed me for what happened. And some of the people that were saying stuff like that were people that are quote unquote leaders in the in the POC community um, that are basically saying stuff like, you know, I'm clairvoyant. I can tell when someone's trouble, you know, but it's like. I am like, I, I'm so young, you know, and like, and, and that happened when I was even younger and stuff is happening to women even younger than me that don't have the life experience to know that this person is an abuser or that is displaying this kind of behavior that you should like have like alert, alert on, you know? So that's the first part. Um, it is important that we talk and a lot of conversations are happening, you know, like, it's not like I didn't tell anybody, um, people knew and the women, um, in the DJ community, you know, women in like electronic, like uh, in the scenes that, you know, pertain this character, you know, we had a net, we had a net of, you know, private messaging, da -da 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 -da. because another thing that happens is that when you put yourself out there and you don't have a protective net that is going to keep you, you know, um, pro yeah, protected, like safe, you know, you are risking putting this information out and you don't know how the other person is going to retaliate. And these men, most of these men, they have power, you know, they have access to, you know, money that can go towards, you know, hiring someone to shut you down hiring someone to, you know, block you online and make it very difficult for you. And it's like, it's not even like I've had like Lana Del Rey fans um, reporting my page for being racist because I said that Lana Del Rey needed to like check her motives when she talks, you know, like or compare, dares to compare herself with the struggles of black women, you know? So stuff like that, you know? So I, I would just say that people need to have patience when it comes to these conversations that it is very very hard that a lot of people in the industry need to pay their bills and that sometimes those people you know 
they don't have the basic training in if you see something say something and a lot of ceos that ha that hold your job and it's the only job that you finally got in your industry are a horrible racist person abuser ta -da 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 -da. but if you say something there goes your job you know so it's like i feel for every single person like i understand every single role but my thing it could it, it's the same for me come out speak when you're ready to do so and be prepared because the online vitriol is something else you know and like the relatives of these people are have access to the to the internet too so you have to be very very um yeah, just be prepared because there's some evil out there. How do you deal with the vitriol? Because you've had to deal with the vitriol. What is your, if you can impart a tip, advice to people in navigating the backlash online, how do you do it? I would say arm yourself with humor and wit. Um, you know, when that whole Halifax Pop Explosion thing was happening, I had at least 150 to 200 messages a day where people were sending me instructions on how to kill myself. You know, I would have like a lot of memes or gifts with, you know, my body and whatever, some picture of me, and they would replace it with the face of a gorilla or a monkey, you know, and, and that like, it, it didn't worry me or upset me. What upset me is that my son was going to watch that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was difficult, but you just have to remember that the people that are doing this are people that you are never going to run into in person. And that if, and if they see you in person, they're cowards. So they have nothing. They can't really hurt you. Emotionally, you know, just just really listen to good music and, you know, have a laugh with the friends, the people that love you. And when people are writing to you, you know, humor is so fantastic. Like, like so many people write me still to this day, like they'll write me like, like a seven page essay on how I'm racist towards white people, you know, like four pages, you know, and then I'll just write, wow, that must have taken you so long i applaud you for the patience and the strength that it must have taken you and the concentration to focus on me thank you for showing me so much love and attention or okay. or, 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 or or you know like or the the easiest one that's a coping mechanism is grammar just clock people in grammar which is like you're racist so like you're you're racist <laughs> And I'm like, I think you mean you are. Thank you. <laughs> you know, so it's just like, that's it. And then people don't bother you anymore, you know. Wonderful. Wit, humor, flowers, yeah. commas. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lido. It's mm -hmm. been great to speak with you. Thank you so much. Enjoy take, the show. Take good care. Bye. Bye.